All right. Hello, 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 friends. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I, let's take advantage of that opportunity with those students to, as part, I mean, if you remember, storytelling was a part of our implementation plan later on. And um, I think uh, I'm learning so much about how voice is a big part of, of community story. Um, of course, it's a big part of our own story. And and I, you know, when I heard him talk about how we 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 have our own narratives, I also think about how society can oppress narratives too, right? So, uh, and that's part of my topic. You know, is is not so much well, it's racism in Fresno, but no matter what city, our all American cities are anchored in what happened in their state and in their country in the formations of those those countries, right? So here's, a, I found this wonderful timeline. I'm not even sure if it's up on the website in, or online anymore, but it's this wonderful timeline where you could scroll across the years and it'll tell you kind of the formation of our country. Um, I took a, just a, a snap of this in, from uh, 1750 to, you know, what, what the, what is, now America, North America, the United States, who kind of had the, the land um, and was already colonizing it from the natives, the Native American Indian um, people that were scattered across the country. So, you know, we had at that time the English, we all know in, through American history, the, you know, English um, kind of set up their first, uh, Jamestown was their first settlement but before them were actually the Spaniards. The Spaniards had, um, had developed the first European colony um, in St. Augustine in Florida. So that was really the Spaniards came over here, landed over here, started to colonize what is now Florida. And then they went into you know, what is now Haiti, Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico, and then on to Mexico. So they actually came through this swath of North America. England was starting to get all of the East Coast. And then the French had landed in New Orleans and they were, they were starting to get all the way up to Canada, which is why you, they speak a lot of French in New Orleans, right? And, and in Canada. Um, so, but as this, you know, if, 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 this timeline just keep moving forward you would see the yellow just starting to go all across the country over time um so you know really this where we are with the united states was colonized sometimes two or three times over if you were a native american in this country so you might have been colonized by the Eng the english or you might have been colonized by the spanish first and then the French, and then the English. So um, that's that's layers of oppression, um, which is, you know, when you if you if you look through the Native American lens, it's like it's not just the English, right? They were they were later on to come. So um, I put the context of that because cities like Fresno were developed because of thinking that was created centuries before okay do i need to point it this direction yeah. no okay okay so so let now we go from our country and how that was developed to california you know, California became a state in 1850. It was part of Mexico. Um, come on in, pass the pointer. Welcome. Um, and and so um, California, they had the war, the Mexican-American War. California became a state in 1850. You know, that was so they were they once again the English were um, the Euro the white Europeans were taking over. From what Spain had already been um, uh, colonizing from the natives, 
which is where how we get Mexico and, and other countries in Central America. Um, so, you know, Fresno, Fresno obviously is, is right in the center of California. Um, there, was, there was already oppression happening with uh, the gold rush. You know, people were coming from all over the world when, when the gold rush kicked in. That's one of really the, the first big waves of why we have so much diversity um, in California was because people groups from all over the world wanted to come and find gold and they end up staying here. That's why we have some Chinatowns in our state, you know, Fresno, Fresno and others. So um, that, that, that became the, the epicenter of, of a lot of things happening in, in California. And then we get into Fresno. So Fresno, um, who, who, were, who can tell me what date, what, what year Fresno was incorporated as a city? Close. 1885, yes, 1885, but it was, a, it was a town, it was a village before that, right? But that's when it became a, an incorporated city. Um, so how did it start? You know, we had, we had, well, incorporated means that you, you are uh, acknowledged by the state um, as an incorporation. So like a business. So a cities have to be, so you've heard unincorporated Kalua, unincorporated highway city. Those were never created as cities. They were settlements that became a, a small town, but never incorporated. There's a lot of unincorporated areas of Fresno County that are not cities. Um, there's really, I think there's what, there's 15 cities in the Fresno County but there's more towns, right? They're unincorporated. Um, so states, cities have to have to get incorporated. Then you get pass through dollars from federal and state money. So it's, it's, it's a lot about business, yeah. So um, business and what does business mean? Money. So, um, so we, uh, uh, East, uh, the, a, a few folks came in, they settled this part with for ag. They built a original little station there um, probably first stagecoach, um, and then and then from there uh, we see how it. And I'm using the current map, so you have some kind of formation of where things are. So here's Southeast Fresno, um, and then from there it kind of shifted to downtown to being the main settlement because of the railroad getting built along where it is now. So um, the railroad really kind of got Fresno to be, and the railroad really comes along 99, that angle right there is 99. Um, and you have the railroad that comes across there. So downtown was established, that was the epicenter of Fresno and everything kind of grew from there. Um, but once again, you know, our Chinatown is the, the bottom section of that downtown area. And that's where um, people of certain ethnicities had to live in Chinatown. And of course that spread into Southwest Fresno, um, the West side, and that's where people of color had to, had to live there. They weren't allowed to live as Fresno grew to the East and to the North, like the Lowell neighborhood and the Jackson neighborhood. These were, these were all early neighborhoods sprouting out in different directions. Um, you know, the, the, there was a little trolley that went down Jackson neighborhood that's now that Green Park Right, so that's that was one of the first historical neighborhoods, and then Lowell was the next this whole older historical neighborhood. Um, but you see, you see the the growth that happened um, throughout the decades. You know, eleven 1 hundred people in 1880, ten thousand, and that that's pretty good growth for a city. Um, those jumps in numbers, um, but you know, the the city going back to um, Fresno was created by white individuals. Um, that that was all about ag business. Um, they had connections. Leland Stanford, um, who was for a little while a governor of the state, senator for the state. He, you know, and his son was named after Stanford University, but he had a lot of political power. So, you know, Fresno, because of it being um, a new ag area in the Central Valley they had some interest in that, some political interest in that. Um, 
and 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 that came with white power that kind of helped anchor in um you know the 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 white uh, landowners that created our ag industry um and you know so what let, let's stop there think back in 1880 what do you think the mindset was for ag owners here in Fresno at that time? What was the existing mindset? Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. They, they, they some of their families might have been plantation owners in the in the South, right? So. One thing I think about racism, what I've learned from trauma-informed learnings and how it affects the brain is, is people came to California with a certain mindset, right? Some of them, some of them were Europeaners. And I, you know, if 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 someone needs to stop and ask questions, you know, to go deeper, you know, stop us anytime. So, you know, mindsets came from the east to the west. So plantation mindsets, um, even if they weren't, they weren't rich white plantation owners, they still had a mindset of, of slavery that if I'm white, I'm better than black people or brown people. And a lot of them didn't really know Mexican culture at all. That was foreign to them on the East Coast. So they were coming to, they knew the black culture in some sense, because they, they were around black people, but they weren't around brown people. They weren't around Latinos too much when people came from the, from the, for the gold rush before uh, uh, California was a state. So the, it's, there was a blending of cultures, but it was still the white culture that was dominant uh, when California was formed and when Fresno was formed, right? I mean, you look at it now where we are a majority, the, the minorities are the majority in Fresno, right? Um, but that's, that's, that's not, that wasn't the case when Fresno was formed as a city, it was white leaders. So there was white thinking. Um, it, it was, it, it's not because they got to Fresno and say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have policies that are oppressing. That was already in their mind already. That was natural to create policies that benefited white people, okay? So, um, you know, they, they, every person that comes into a scenario with their own mindset is formulated based on how they grew up, what were they were exposed to, and all of that. And, and sometimes if we, if, if someone comes, you know, there probably were some woke people, woke white people at that time, but they were probably the minority, right? So they probably didn't speak up too much. Um, but, you know, and I share all that because, because policies were created in Fresno that limited where people of color could live, this area. And of course, you all know, they're, they're, they're still, I mean, they're, they're not binding anymore, but there still are deeds on homes that you can find that say, no, you, this house can't be sold to a person of color or specific people groups, right? Armenians, Blacks, Mexicans, so on and so forth. Okay. so. Every city in America was formulated from past thinking up until now, right? And we, and we still have to deal with that. You all have to deal with it as you guys do civic infrastructure work day to day. Here's everyone have seen that this is the red line. This is downtown Fresno right here. And then the, the it's more pinkish, but the, those were the, the deeper rooted issues and the yellow had some, some issues with, with discrimination. Um, but you see the west side over here. You start to see a little bit of the Jackson neighborhood. Um, this would be the, the 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 Jackson neighborhood right here, that blue spot, because that was still where you, if you were white, you could live in that area. Um, but then you start to see the progression going north. This was like 1937 or something like that. Um, but then I I can kind of contextualize it to our current map, um, and you see. Redlining was when um, the, the institutions, especially the banks, looked at what areas were worthy of being invested in and which ones were not based on who lived in those neighborhoods. So that, that, that really set the formation of how you invested in certain areas of town to this day. 
or content, and you wouldn't have any of that coming in the consider the inclusive channel to prevent higher up mm -hmm. where the hospital those mansions. Yeah. Each known by the owner, the particular owner, I bought balls in the back. Church up and those are like little lower class and then you go further out and the house still looks like right. The social economic situation as they grew over time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll see pockets of it in, in other parts of town where you, you really just go a couple of blocks and it's totally different, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, redlining, and then and then over time, um, just it becomes a mindset of how you invest, or and then but then you also look at you add that to the growth pattern of Fresno too, and and the mentality um, and the political culture of how Fresno grew. Um, so you you know you you start to see, you know, people were going as time progressed, people were going north up along Blackstone became the artery um, and more of the richer people were moving up north and leaving the south, right? Because what was it, the 19, 1930s or 40s, they were, they, they were already starting to plan freeways more than 99, 180 being one, 41 being one. So when they started having plans about 180, cutting through like the Lowell neighborhood and going through their, the Lowell residents were moving north they didn't want to be a part of a freeway cutting through their neighborhood so that started the 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 beginnings of of the northern flight and what people would say white flight yeah that so this let me see if my next so yeah the the sprawl was starting to happen there so when you think about when you think about fresno right around world war ii you know, Fresno was still around that, maybe that big, you know, so this is pretty much that blue area in 1950, right? So there's our population. Um, and then um, because of the redlining, people were moving north. This was never invested in the west side. So no, you know, people didn't, people that moved to Fresno, they were told, especially if you're white, don't go there. You know, either stay along Huntington or keep moving north because that's where that's where Fresno is growing. And then you see how over time, th this is color coded the growth of the city based on the decades. So you got 1950 right here, and then 2000, all of that brown. So that's 50 years. That's 50 years of growth. And it all went north. And then when you couldn't go north any further, because Fresno ends at the river, you started to go northwest. And now, now to this day, we're heading southeast, right? The next, the next 20 years of the Fresno's, Fresno City's vision is southeast Fresno to develop this swath right here, right? So the mindset hasn't changed. Design, right, it's by design. And I think there is our minds are created to um, to heal themselves and experiences matter, words matter, we can make meaning out of words mm -hmm. and out of experiences. So if I keep creating the same experience, then for generations that'll be the experience. But if I like what we're doing, add a narrative or add words that have meaning to an experience, we can change biologically how we think and how we see things. So people say, oh, well, this community, these people can't do this because you haven't given them the opportunity to do it in your experiences. And so the whole thing out of my mind is that my brain is exploding right now with all kinds of stuff. But mm -hmm. it is because I, I mean, I really, I'm, I'm structurally, I see things and and yeah. Structure and I put things together, and so you look at that, and it's like, okay, we have people with money who come. I'm going to drive the property value down. I'm gonna disrepair it. I'm gonna create poverty and all these things because humans are capital too. Like I always say, yeah. we, we need the narrative because if 
if this is a great big business, the United States of America Incorporated, whenever, then the people that create or that we need to create funding, get money for, we're going to use the disparity in this community to get money to build this community, but it's not going to help the people. It's going to help the people who are qualified to handle the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, because again, you know, words matter and experiences matter. And because I have experience and because my family dealt with this, and some of you are incompetent as crap, like really, but they're put in position to, to still be in position for the next generation to keep yeah. a community at a certain level of um, despair. So let's let's stop and have a group conversation about what you last just shared is why, I mean, people have been put into position to make these changes, right? So, and, and it's been pretty consistent, the type of thinking that's been put into office throughout the years, because the same decision-making has happened, the same choices have been made in how Fresno grows. Um, so why is it important that you guys do what you all do? How 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 do we change the narrative? Well, I, that's what uh, Lisa was saying about going to community and uh, educate edu educate the community on self awareness, mm -hmm. self independence, and also identifying with uh, uh, gifts and talents and abilities that we have within our community, and so that we can bring our poverty from within, opposed to from depending on it on some point from without. That's why I like the idea so much about okay. the because it gives us an opportunity to uh, speak out and begin to expect change. Because we live it out, we live it out. we're speaking it out in front of when we live it. Good. Thank you. Um, you spoke about the mindset of the people that are going to suffer. So, um, like you said, uh, it has to change the uh, mindset of the people. You know, they can't go on that set that they can. can't do it, whatever has been said already. It's in the mindset of the people. Mm -hmm. and they take it yes. So, we have to, the mindset of the people has to be changed. Yeah. So along with the mindset of the team, healing has to take place because, along with that, there has been ignorance and there's been pain. So physically, emotionally, and mentally. So the mindset of the people has to change. Yes. And and let's stop there and I'll continue. Thank you. So going back, going back, I need my clicker. Yes. Common form uh, that I've learned, you know, they, 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 they call it time in versus time out, right? So, you know, we, kids get being disobedient, put them on time out. And so the indication of what about a time in or bring them in versus pushing them out. And I think to connect that to the neighborhood work is people, yes, they need to work on changing the narrative, but they also need that safe place that's going to champion that conversation, to champion that. That movement with I live moving forward, and that's that's you all doing the work in the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. You're hearing the, the neighbor narrative, and now we're also seeing a place that you can go to, and the people in the, in the neighborhood are comfortable with. Yeah, that's bringing the movement. Yeah. 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 Okay, hold on. So when you have that mindset, what's the mindset? Sarah, are you going to say something? Oh, I was going to say, I have to say that for Dr. Hayes, we do have our neighborhood association. And that's kind of our way of like really connecting with the day and uh, helping each other out and like making each other better. Yeah. So, mindsets, that to me, the, the human element of, of community engagement is probably the most important for me um, because mindsets were already happening in Europe that came to America. 
And when the, the oppressor mindset is, is constantly pushed on people of other groups, things change in our minds, right? Over, and we're talking about centuries. And you add things like slavery, which actually has proven now to change bodies biologically. Yeah, you know, it, it, it creates a mindset of oppression that leads us from a national mindset to state mindsets, to city mindsets. And then the, 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 the oppression continues because it's the same mindset that is constantly pushed and pushed. There's a narrative that is pushed and the narrative isn't yours. They don't even wanna hear your narrative. They don't care about your narrative. You have to adhere to our narrative, right? Now, I don't, I don't want, it's like, we don't, have, we don't have a ton of white people here. So sometimes people get offended and stuff here, but the Spaniards, the Spaniards had the same mindset oppression is oppression it don't matter right now in this this time and day there's there's black people oppressing black people in africa right there's there's latinos oppressing latinos in central south america there's 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 russia trying to oppress another their own people neighbors so oppression happens in every form right um and and I, I feel like even in today's society, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, Latino, Asian, if you're upper class, you have a, you create a certain mindset that oppresses lower middle class people. So it's a it's a social economic oppression too, right? So all of these things are layered on and it, it affects our minds, that's proven. It affects our social, emotional, mental state. That's proven. It affects our physical state. That's proven. All this stuff is, I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my ears. This is stuff that I read and studies that I read. And, and, and we, we kind of know this already, which is why it's so important that you come in into these neighborhoods and you build genuine connectivity with them. That takes time, right? Um, it's not going to happen at an event. You've got to do, you've got to be present in your neighborhood, you've got to invite them into a comfortable space where they they can build connectivity with the, each other, like a community meeting, like, like if this was our community meeting, you all lived in this Lowell neighborhood, but from different parts of it, we would say, hey, tell us your story in the Lowell neighborhood, tell us about you. you know. And then, then after that cohesion is built, then you start, well, tell us about what's going on in the neighborhood. What do you guys wanna deal with together? What, what do you think? What's great? What are the assets that we have that we can address some of the problems that we have, right? We can take care of this ourselves. We might need help from the city. We might need help from nonprofits or whomever, but how do we take the lead, the ownership of our own neighborhood um, and change the narrative of our neighborhood? If I lived in the Lowell neighborhood, all I, all I hear about in the news is that when there's a shooting or a fire or slumlord, you know, and something like that. They, the news is rarely here for all the amazing things that are happening on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, right? So how do we change the narr- narrative of our, of our community? And when I say community, it's the people, right? I mean, if there, there was no one that lived here, there's no community. It's just a bunch of homes, right? Buildings. One thing that I've noticed is there's a lot of um, residents that are just fed up, so they're not even willing to change the narrative. Mm-hmm. So that's just that becomes a ripple effect. They're, they're the ones that you, you really want to get a hold of. You talk to because they don't, they've been oppressed, like you said, they've been changed for such a long time that they're just like, Oh, I'm already old. I don't want. I don't want to go into any of that. Before I even change, I'm gonna go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the main problem that I see is, um, for me personally, I don't know about anybody else's neighborhood, but how do you get to those people? So, well, let's. How how do you get to? 
you guys have been doing this for a little bit now. How, how do you get to those that generally don't get engaged, that, that have the mindset, eh, it don't matter what we do, nothing's going to work. It's, we've tried all that stuff before, nothing's going to happen. How do you do that? A selective group and doing the video game in the morning and um, having like little discussion about how long they've been living in the neighborhood, what do they do, what's their hobby, and if they have like a selection of what their hobby is, like for example, fishing, we'll do a topic with someone that you know is asked to provide a fishing tournament class or something with a program like yoga that like you just get me stretched out or going for a walk and just getting to know one another and just reaching out where. Where they're at, they are at, you know, and then just providing some 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 small details, in that just like, thank you for being here. Here's a here's a bottle of um, it's one of the refrigerant um, house soap, and that's hope to see you next week. And what's next week? Another another discussion and follow up. Mm -hmm. Either follow up, and then either either continue from the follow up or vice versa. Yeah, the and the thing is, there's always got to be a next step. There's always there's there's a progression because it takes time. You, you don't change a mindset quickly, right? They they keep that inside them. They're wait they're waiting for this to fail because they've lived that out already. So that's why when you keep inviting, they keep coming back and it's oh this is this is a pretty good. I'm liking this. Like hey, this is pretty good. Now I'm talking to people and I'm getting to build relationships with them, and now now we're working together. So that's from going from here to here might take a year, two years, right? So that's why it's very important that we say we're going to be here because they're used to people coming and going. That is, that's been for, for a century that their history, people coming and going, coming with the survey, never hearing anything about that survey. They don't even know who did the survey, what outcomes were from the survey, who benefited from the survey, right? They probably just got funding to do a survey. They picked your neighborhood. They don't care about your neighborhood. They just, they wanted to extract something from you, right? Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's, one, that's one thing. Go ahead. I'm just concerned that if you were to do it in a deal, just to, to repeat, 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 repeat. But if you start focusing on that for all the good children, that this is going to happen, this happens for a lot of parents and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And on that path from here to here, there's there's maybe a little bit of action that they're doing together. Um, that has to be a, you know, the challenge sometimes is also what happens in those meetings, a safe space that you build or you don't build. Because if if people people come with these different perspectives, right? Um, and even they're all oppressed of some sort, but they still come with their own unique perspective and language barriers and things like that. And they come, you know, so you have to create a space that's welcome to all. Sometimes that means that there's translation all the time, right? And and sometimes that means that 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 other people help make the decisions of what that that looks like. So that that different different perspectives add to the culture of the environment. So there's so many nuances to it, 
right? Because, uh, you know, if people don't feel safe, they don't feel be like they belong in that group, they're not going to come back, right? So it's it's hard. It's hard because I, uh, because of the human element, because we're all unique in our mindsets and what we want out of a conversation um, so that we all have to feel like we belong within this group. Um, and that's not been... That's not been what the narrative has been in our country for people of color. The narrative was built, you belong if you're white, right? Um, you know, and it's, it's changing slowly, um, but mindsets, it's hard, it's still hard for change to happen. Here's uh, from 1990 to 2016, the, the density of white residents in Fresno, and you see the density from 1990 and how it's kind of, they've moved a little bit further north and to Clovis. Um, you know, it just shows a little bit of the change of, of uh, where, where a specific people group are, are or not over time. Um, here's some wonderful old ENP maps. So all this stuff of, of of policies that led to disinvestment that led to people having to live in certain neighborhoods of people not having voice rep, not having representation that on the city council that um, up really up until 2016 honestly um it's been white people that have been the decision we've still not had uh um i think a person of color being the mayor of fresno We've not had a Latino mayor. We've not had a black mayor. So it's been white, white people. Um, so we we are still searching for that. Um, but because of all of that, because of the human element of all of this, because Fresno has always been a city of refuge, meaning that because going back to California, because of the the gold rush, people of color came from all over the world. Well, that's why a lot of our cities are predominantly people of color in the Central Valley because they stayed here. Um, but then you add like the Armenians, they were leaving oppression in their land. They and a lot of them ended up in the Central Valley, but they were leaving something traumatic. So they come with that baggage too. So did the African Americans, so did the Mexicans, so Central Americans, so did the Hmong and the Lao, so did the 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 Syrians, just like seven years ago and the Punjabis um, you know and and Afghanistan folks are coming to Fresno now so we've always kind of been and a lot of our cities have been in the Central Valley just uh, a city of refuge people have left oppression to come to a different kind of oppression right a, a more structured oppression um, in southern countries it's not even it's just oppression it's like in your face oppression it's we're a little bit more we're, sometimes we're a little bit more subdued oppression um but it's still oppression but because of all of that we have we have social outcomes that affect us so poverty poverty this wasn't this is not the most recent census information but it's going to be fairly close P pay attention to the color coding green being fairly good yellow being eh, and red being pretty bad so Poverty, you see schools, most of our red schools are in the concentrated poverty area. You guys probably have seen all this stuff. You look at health the outcomes, you know, there's not even a ton of green in that. Geez, not even up north. Um, and then, did I lose it? Maybe that was the last one. Um, you know, there's, there's other layers if we added like, uh, like crime, if we added, you know, you know, investment in business, things like that, you know, we we'd have the same, we'd have the same color code. We we're gonna. So do cities of refuge also get federal money for allowing people who? Are no, 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 no. That's the term I use. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, now we have politicians that fly refugees to other cities so i don't know that's that is the immigration reform i suppose i don't know um 
but but you know that I think all of this kind of goes into into why it's so important. That's why, honestly, for drive civic infrastructure is one of the foundational. Bless you. Fun of the foundational. We've got to change the narrative of our people. We've got to get them to believe that they have a role in their own neighborhood that affects their family. Bless you. But that 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 same narrative can be spread across the city, and um, you know the the mindset of a city can change over time, where we don't make now, you know sometimes. I, I get, I get, no, I don't get it. I don't get why we had to sprawl so far north so quickly, right? That was, that's, those were developers running the political infrastructure of a city. It was all about business, right? Now they, you know, they flip it around and say, oh, we want to build you nice homes, quality of life, right? Um, but Fresno is already, They've already paid the price for that. We were almost bankrupt in 2008 because of our growth. A lot of cities in, in the California were almost bankrupt. Some were, by, actually some went into bankruptcy um, because we grew so fast. We couldn't, we didn't, back in, back in, you know, 1960, they were thinking about all the sprawl, but they didn't understand that they had to pay for this sprawl in 40 years. The infrastructure, the roads, underground. The, the sewer, all that stuff costs money, right? Park maintenance, we're paying for it now, right? That's why we have to get a, a special tax just for parks. We're having to pay for bad decisions 60 years ago. That's why we have, you know, we have to get a, a tax just for our zoo. That's why we have to give a tax just for our transportation because of bad decision making, you know, decades ago. So, um, you know, we're still, we're still kind of in that same mindset too. Um, we, we would never run our own family budget that way. We couldn't afford, we wouldn't be allowed to actually. <laughs> so, but we, we put people in decision-making tables that we don't even know, we don't, we don't know what their mindset is about all this stuff. So it's really important for you all to change the narrative of your neighborhoods and then collectively the people of the community make good decisions of who they elect into positions that will truly represent them, right? And, and, and their, their values, because um, if, if you can start doing that in more neighborhoods of Fresno, you get, you've got district three, what, what is it, District 5? Is that Luis's? Yeah, 5. You know, you start, you start getting these neighborhoods to coalesce together in districts, and they say, hey, it's like, I think we all want the same type of quality representation. You have power in the people. There's been no accountability for politicians, no accountability once they're elected. Because they, they, they can do whatever they want once they get into City Hall, because they know that so long as they have they have probably the, the thousand votes that the, is all they need to get elected. So, you know, a thousand people making a decision for 30,000 people. Does that seem equitable? No, but that's what we have. That's reality. So if we don't, and now we don't, I don't, I've never told people what, who they should vote for. I tell them, you gotta, you gotta pay attention. Let me educate you on what, I do. I used to do these classes just so people understand the narrative that has been created. I don't tell them who to vote for. You have to make that own decision, right? But make an informed decision, and well, actually, register so you can vote. And then you got to vote. But then make an informed decision about who you vote for, right? So um, you know. Or the other, they're going to be, I think, you know, either 
can they take they can they go to college if they want to practice for the next thirty years. Yeah. 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 So, absolutely. Well, get, and getting back, but it start all remember, it all starts with that small, safe container you create in your neighborhood. And then you develop, you develop. All of you, I'm, were probably not as civically active 10 years ago as you are now, I'm going to guess. Someone invested in you or something stirred in you. We've got to spark something in people, right? That's what, that's what your job is, to spark something in them to get engaged in the community. And maybe it starts in their school for their kids. You know, maybe maybe it's for parks. You know, maybe it's for elections. I don't know. That's that's why you got to get to know them, get and know their story, and then guide them. Because maybe 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 the drive work isn't the best thing for them. Maybe it's F chip or it's cradle to career or something else. It doesn't matter. Get them involved in something because that's going to benefit their growth, and that they're going to come back and they're going to be telling their neighbors about it and things like that. That's what we want to stir that mo that momentum over time so that people get civically engaged. That, that is civic infrastructure. There's an infrastructure, there's a strategy of doing this with our residents and our youth over time. It's a structure and the civic part is people. It's people, it's relationships, it's development. So it, it's gotta go from, some, from simple projects to simple community meetings to more intentional community meetings at get them rallied to address something, then they, they address it. Even if they don't win what they're shooting for, they come back and say, okay, that didn't work this time, but what did we, what did we learn from that process together? So we keep trying. Maybe there's a, there's a next thing that they address. So, um, you know, that's what gets them. And then at some point, some of these folks like you all, they, they, are, they are at a place where it's like, okay, I, I love my group, but I need to be, I feel a call to be addressing that. It has nothing to do with drive, has nothing to do with their neighborhood, but they want to get involved with that. And that's great, right? That they, they've become, they've taken ownership of their own civic world and engagement world. And now they're choosing the things that they bounce into, right? Um, most likely they're going to still want to get involved in what's going on in their neighborhood because they have an investment. They have a, they have a, a stake in that, right? Their kids are in that neighborhood. So um, that's, that's a process of civic infrastructure that, that we want with DRIVE. That's why we hire you guys to, to do that work, right? Remember, we're not hiring you to do projects, although we want you to leverage your projects for that resident engagement, right? We're, we're hiring you to build cohesiveness with the residents in your neighborhood, walk alongside them, develop them, you know, so that they have their own ownership when I launched DNP, my goal was, you know, was originally to mobilize a church. Well, you know, that was that was the vision back in 2008. I always told myself if I got to a good point where the churches were mobilized and EMP went away and they their work continued, then it was a success, right? So we want you to have a similar mindset. as like if you if your resident group doesn't need you anymore, that's a good sign. That means they can run their own meetings. They've got ownership of their own neighborhood. You know, maybe we hire you to go do something in the next neighborhood, right? So it's not healthy for them to be reliant on you five years from now. That that's actually dependency, and that's not good, right? So we want them to have ownership of their own neighborhood. Does that make sense? T tell me, tell me some, some. Let's start with the positive. What are some great things you guys are seeing in your work with civic infrastructure? The street saints, what, what, what's some good? Okay. Thank you. Nia? I have that sign for the spirit. And um, they're wanting to know how they can do things on their own, like uh, 
one sheet always comes to me for everything. I say it's on the call for consultation, but I use you as a reference. Like when you write a letter for me to say that I come to your meetings or that you know me, um, or how do I get on the computer to find out how to do something at the city if you wanted to, um, something, something that they're teaching me. But just so you can learn to navigate. Well, can I come to your office and use the clinic? I'm seeing them be more independent, like going from wanting you to do, wanting you to do something for them, to wanting you to show them that when they, they do it. Um, can you do it? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what about Jackson? Um, well, for my, for my purposes, uh, I would say the consultation clinic that I'm doing in the county is kind of happy to work on doing it What about generation changers in Lincoln? Lilia? Uh, 
una de las cosas que yo te digo a ti es que mi vida sea así es que yo no sea la que diga las palabras, sino que los residentes que viven cuesta digan qué está haciendo esa niña con aquí directamente en el mundo. So yeah, you're using my mom. Me and I just met yesterday because we still have to do our survey for the survival and protection of the mom. Um, and if I was like, hey, what do you want from me? I was like, I'm going to right? So that's something not good. But for me, it's very early in the morning. Mm -hmm. So early on, I want to know. Because I think it's going to be honest with themselves and with us. Yeah. Because I don't know. Because like, we really want to uplift their voices. Yeah, thank you. Martin Park? It, it, people are thirsty for a, a, a safe, fun, welcoming environment. They're thirsty, even more so with COVID. There's a different, you know, things are different than they were three years ago because of the pandemic. I mean, think about the term isolation. We were literally telling people to stay amongst themselves, right? That's three years of a, of a mindset or stay within yourself, isolate, right? Socially distance. Yeah, so it's, you know, we're, we're, we're combating that a little bit too. Um, so what time do we need to be done here? It's, okay, do you have other things you wanna cover? So, so what, are, what are some of the challenges to, the, to your civic infrastructure work? It's got to be challenges. I had challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's ha how what's your solution? Residents more involved because we have other residents that 
the same kind of thing. They were all they did that thirty twenty, thirty years and they rarely got referred to the board and you know, they never get a council member that really knows about it. Mm-hmm. Never once had anybody tried to do anything and uh, to try to change that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Like, no, it's will be there. And it's like fine, that'll be there, but let's get him out of it too. Like get the year in and the finance and yeah. everything. Yeah. So the so the I mean one of the equitable equitable things within community engagement is making sure that there's either a staff person or a volunteer that speaks the languages of the neighborhood, right? So that's part of the solution, and that's I mean I had to I had to deal with the same thing at DMP. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean there's parents that also. Like I've actually met some parents of my daughter's personal class that at some point are like, oh, just call me and I'll come and help you with your program. I'm like, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But it's because connected with people with parents and you got to like yeah. get in. Yeah. Okay. Others? I have a lack of male buy in like I have. May, men? Men. The men don't show up. The women show up and then their uh, presence is limited because. A lot of their households already have work, and they have to all have to be here at four o'clock, and then ten o'clock, and they plan for after the year. Mm-hmm. And it, it just throws a lot of uh, the male presence isn't there, and their voices aren't their opinions, yeah. the voices that they think it's not they don't really know anything. So it's more with the women. Okay. Uh, mi reto mayor yo pienso ha sido este momento es que se sigue sola trabajando. Este queremos que se um, seguir creciendo con trabajo personal el no tener un espacio donde estar las juntas eso es para mí es un reto que tenemos que superar y decir vamos a encontrar un, un lugar que se está seguro principalmente para las familias que van a venir a necesitar eso the first challenge is uh, not having staff right still uh, not having the space to meet the biggest challenge uh, we have our meeting job and now we're uh, sleeping uh, using a work from home right but it was hot in the summer like uh, it's gonna get cold so having an actual meeting space um is really yeah and the language okay de esta manera mm-hmm. nosotros yeah. tenemos que conseguir voluntarios que nos que hablen el inglés para que no lo malentendan so that has not really been on me in gathering volunteers or again staff i've had to go out and help me figure yeah. that one out yeah that's good and then for men is the same thing as language having sometimes having a male volunteer or staff person so it's they see it as a peer to peer type of thing with men. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes it doesn't help. Sometimes it, you know, we're we're unique. We're sometimes we're hard to reach. What else? What else? Let me. You're you're. I, I don't know. You you look young. You might be forty years old. I don't know. But you look young. How 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 do we how do how do we what are some celebrations or what are some challenges but solutions to reaching youth? I know for the way we started reaching the youth was providing events that don't necessarily scream out that we're yes, we're trying to help the neighborhood, but we're just coming to build a connection. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I just want to see youth is good. It don't matter if I wear this shirt or not. Like I'm coming trying to be a resource for you. So when you show a kid that like I'm genuinely here to help you, but you show someone I have your best interest no matter what I'm no matter what shirt I'm wearing, no matter who I'm with, no matter what, it provides an openness that you can talk to them and say, you know, like I've been going through this today and I need your help with this. And for you, at least for me, that's really helpful because there's not a lot of people or older people that you can talk to about mm-hmm. like, because this is me. The youth, they feel like the older people don't know what we're going through because social media and these things to them, they think that you guys never had any experience in it. That's why it's probably the same thing, just different ways. Right. So when you are able to connect with the youth in a way that isn't coming off as overbearing or isn't coming off as me trying to force something on you, you can have an un- unhindered line of communication that can only be success and it can only be the part of the relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, how old are you? Yeah, I'd love. I, I, I think I, I mentioned to Jason and to you and some others that 
um, I'm helping Department of Behavioral Health and Public Health do some learning from the community. So one of the focus groups that I want to help put together are youth. Um, I'd love to, for you to be a part of it and any, any youth colleagues that you have really trying to educate an institution of what they need to be thinking about, what the realities are in the neighborhoods. That's the whole purpose. You know, they, they, they gathered a bunch of institutional nonprofit leaders to talk about mental health in the community. And I said, I mean, we, we are, we're all community, but the people that we serve are not here. Uh, what, I mean, are we trying to make, are we trying to create solutions based on what we think or do you think we should actually stop and have conversations with the community and truly get an understanding of what's going on in the area of, of social emotional health, mental health, physical health. So I'd love to, to have you a part of that um, and any other youth that you guys have. We're, we're looking at, you know, 16 to 22 year olds um, that are open to having a conversation, that feel comfortable having a conversation, I should say. Uh, a Zoom, a Zoom meeting, um, and then I think uh, Jennifer and Susie are helping me with their their wellness women's group. They're going to have another one. It's I. It's once again it goes back to it's going back to institution narratives, figuring out solutions for the community without them hearing the community, right? So I we've got to keep creating those bridges because um, otherwise decisions are made based on assumptions.